as of about an hour ago or an hour and a half, I did read all the posts. There are a lot of them missing. I sent emails saying, you know, this post. So I'm, I'm not going to remind you if it's just one week late because there's a leeway there. But for the ones that are two weeks late, three weeks late, and four weeks late, I did send a note saying it's now two weeks late. I don't have any trouble giving you leniency, but you have to have reasons. When it's two weeks late or more, you have to have reasons. And make sure to inc include those at the top of the post. Um, don't assume that I will remember that Kasturi came late, you know? I mean, how could I not remember? Well, it's just when you're reading all these, you just want to keep going. And so it's just a different uh, frame of mind that I'm in. But anyway, I let me do once again, there's still some students that, that didn't get it. Every single week, you come to class with reactions to the reading. So sometimes it's just random three reactions for today, like it has been many times. You come with an example of a Demeter archetype, somebody you know personally, and somebody in the public eye in your country. And if you can't think of someone in your country, then you would think in your region of the world or, you know, just in the world in general. But so then you, when you meet in groups, so I'll put you in groups two separate times. Like one time is to discuss the one you know personally, and then I'll bring us back together. And then, um, the next one, it, and I'll try to point out some major um, areas, right? Major issues. One of the main things here, one of the main themes that I keep harping on is that each one has a natural passion. It's sacred, it's necessary, it's important. Obviously, maternal instinct is important. Every single one can go too far and it gets poison, you know, it becomes a big problem. So, <clears throat> so if while you're in your groups, you still have leftover time, I, I'll try to give you 15 minutes unless you don't want it because I've been reading the posts and it looks like students do like listening to other students and they're learning a lot from the other students' examples. So, but, but as soon as the conversation lags and you have nothing more to say, come back into the big group and I'll bring you all together. The goal is to keep you focused on the material for the hour and a half that we're together. The other, okay, so for each day, what you came with, three reactions to, that stand out to you during class, and then your overall takeaway. And this one would be how can this mothering instinct be tapped into or, you know, recognized in a way that will enable women to create a better culture moving forward. And of course, this is really a big problem because that maternal instinct, up until very recently, it was considered the only important thing, right? Either the wife or the mother, that's it. And so that instinct was molded in a way that created this extreme, uh, you know, extremely potent relationship, but it can be positive or negative. And 
Now the students at AUW and a lot of their friends and a lot of women all, all over the world, women in the public eye, first and the first wave of feminism, they tended not to have children or to have a nanny or something. But now there are a lot of women with public careers who also have one or two children. It's not, you know, considered impossible or immoral or anything like that. But the other problem is that for most women, they're put into a situation where they're forced to choose a career or a family. And even John Stuart Mill, who was very progressive about women, we went over his outline. If you remember, he talked about, um, he had this argument for why women should be treated equally. And he said, why is this difficult to prove? Well, because habit and custom are so powerful and they go against what really is natural and it's hard to prove that a negative, what we're doing is wrong. Anyway, even John Stuart Mill, who was a great supporter of women's rights, thought that women had to choose between a career and a family. So, so uh, Rahima, you want to, did you want to either, okay. <laughs> So this problem of having to choose a family or a career. Now in Europe and the other develop, developed countries, it isn't, uh, Europe really allows for the parents of young children to work fewer hours. They have high quality daycare. They, they, they invest in their children. They think you need to pay taxes because having children have high quality of life their first seven years is important to everybody. It's a social uh, good and it's a social necessity. That's Europe. They have a different philosophy. Um, okay. And so in the US, we have a different philosophy. We have a minimal government, keep the government out of my life philosophy. And that is really hard on women um, because in the US, we tend to think the goal of life is to be successful, either power or money. And so keeping government out of my life I don't wanna pay taxes for somebody else. Everybody should just achieve and make money. And if you make enough money, you pay for your own childcare. So what happens in, in America, and I don't know what happens in your countries. You can you know, talk about that. But in America, it, there's a huge problem with the, uh, the lower income women have poor quality childcare, plus they have the greatest need to go back to work, even though they don't want to. They don't like their jobs as much. And a big chunk of their income has to go to childcare. But even then it's under, it's the quality is not good. And the people in those professions, pre-kindergarten, daycare, they get a very low wage, almost minimum wage for these jobs. So they have to love children a lot in order to work that hard for that little money. Or they have to just care about the fact that so many children in the lower half or two thirds of our economy are not getting decent care from adults in their first seven years of life. And that's formative, that's a big deal. So um, I, again, I am 
really eager to find out how your societies are dealing with this. But in the US, if you have a lot of money, no problem, right? You can have child gold plated childcare, you know, whatever you want. But if you don't have money, you can, it can be pretty low quality. Um, so we leave it to the individuals to make these decisions and to cope with uh, childcare. And that's really hard on women. So the Demeter archetype has been, uh, you know, has been blown up and had to be reformed, really, because now, as my students at AUW say, the expectation for many women is that they do combine career and, and child raising, but they still have the, the, their responsibility is much greater for the child in the home than her husband's. The expectation is not equal. Like they both go to work and they both come home and they both take care of kids and they both cook and clean, you know, that is not the expectation. On the other hand, if women want to have careers, they are often criticized because they're not becoming mothers. I mean, you've already, uh, posts have already indicated that. And on the other hand, if they're mothers, they don't, they aren't given opportunities for more education and eventually a career. So um, I, I want you to talk about that. But for the, at the beginning, let's just talk about archetypes and um, examples of people you know. And I hope that you, you know, it, it's of interest. I know one student said, my mother is just a total Demeter. We had kids in our house all the time, right? And then, and I, the other thing that's really important to me is that AUW students are not all Artemis and Athena. They don't have to have power, you know, aggression, achievement, success the way men define it. That doesn't have to be their top priority. But if women really are Demeter types, um, most educated women like you will go on to have a career. And then they flourish in careers like nursing, teaching, um, uh, counseling. So there is a great need for women who have this nurturing instinct to eventually have both a family and the kind of career that really taps into that. So AUW um, students can go on and get careers of this type, could get careers in K through 12 education, especially preschool education, why not? Um, or nursing, or, I mean, they're in public health. And it is curious for me to know, is that taught with the emphasis on that public health professionals will be working with women and children, right? Mostly, rather than making them sort of uh, mini doctors or something. Do you wanna tap in to the nurturing instinct as a part of living out that profession to its highest level. Um, then there's the problem of counseling because there is a big need for people to have therapists and counselors, but um, I taught philosophical psychology and the students had did research papers. So I know that there are very, very few. <laughs> therapists and counselors, but AUW women's role in the world is to break new ground, right? To become a kind of woman that there hasn't been 
uh, before in their countries or in their villages or in their regions or whatever. So you have to, you have to envision it, you have to read about, you have to research it before you can possibly become it, right? So, but before you decide what you want to do, you have to decide what is it that really drives you the most. And if were you a little girl that was playing mommy all the time, were, did you always want to play house? Were you um, an adolescent who um, thought of boy, uh, boys as just little boys that you have to take care of and they're attracted to men who need them and they like nurturing them or something? This is not me, <laughs> but it doesn't matter, you know? I have met women like who really get married just because they want to have babies. So I've, because I've been a mom and I took time out and I was in a lot of social situations just with other moms, I, you know, I can, I get this. It's part of my life. And um, I've met women that most PhDs in philosophy never met. <laughs> And they've never been in the midst of discussions that I have been in the midst of. And I'm very happy about that because it makes my life a lot more complete and a lot more human. Um, so anyway, so why don't you start out with examples from your personal life of women like this and whether those women from your personal experience have trouble juggling career and family or they give up trying or they never wanted to or it's they thought they wanted to just be moms and wives and they're changing their mind and is that because it's not natural for them they were just trying to please other people or is it because it is natural for them, but they don't have any other options. They wanted to be like professional caregivers and they aren't given that option. So, all right, I stop talking and I'll just divide you into groups. Um, we have uh, three, three of the students are UG3. And so I was thinking that we could divide into smaller groups and the UG3 students, it doesn't have to be the UG3 students that are kind of the leaders, but just to make sure, you know, there's somebody in the group that can, is, um, has been in school longer. So let me just ask them if they would mind keeping track of their group. And if one of them says, no, I don't want to, I don't want to take that on, just let me know. So Pooja, would you be okay with that? Yes, Professor. Good morning. Hi. What about Roshan, Roshani? Uh, yes, Professor. I'm here as well. Okay. And then what about um, Sadia? Yes, Professor, I'm available, but uh, during the happy rainfall, I, maybe I got disconnected any time because my phone battery and data is full. Oh, okay, that works. That's okay. We won't test that because that's a little complicated. So we'll go back to two groups. And if anybody else, it doesn't mean that these people have to lead all the time. It's just they're the backup. I actually think you should try taking turns and um, making sure that everybody practices doing this. It just means starting out the discussion, keeping it on task. Um, but I, again, I don't mind if you, you don't have to talk, you know, first, you can make it a conversation. It's just women talking about women's lives. So definitely you can interrupt or you can just have a meet, a conversation like you'd have on campus or something, as long as everybody eventually gets to talk. So after about seven minutes or something, make you know just ask if there is somebody who hasn't said anything, um, and it, and it's fine if you don't 
not everybody's been able to take their first turn by seven minutes. It's just that there's somebody that hasn't asked the, the people who have been um, presenting, ask them, any of them, a question. And so make sure everybody gets a chance. Um, and it's part of just learning oral communication skills, but it's part of everybody should have opinions about this. This is about you guys. It's also about international culture. I mean, this is serious stuff moving forward. Um, we cannot move forward uh, globally unless we figure out how to deal with motherhood in a, in a meaningful way that doesn't harm anybody, right? Doesn't harm women, it doesn't harm children because unless we work that out, we're gonna have big trouble um, at, in the next generation. All right, here we go. I'll do two groups and make sure there's a UG uh, three student that Pooja and um, Roshani, one of them is in one of the groups and one is in the other. So. There's Pooja. Um, there, okay. Uh, with continuation, uh, but uh, she had to take like uh, baby, like give birth. After after like give birth, uh, she has to uh, she has to like uh, give up her higher education uh, because she has only focus like on the like taking care of her children like it's a like uh, main things uh, of our like village area like all the time women are faces this issue always like they think that um, if i take a baby like it will uh, fully a family uh, like uh, i have nothing to do uh, like even uh, like uh, like outside of this my family or taking care of my baby or like taking care of my husband something like that so okay. i think it's different like do you think um women are women still wanting to have big families or are they are they wanting smaller families uh like uh in this time uh like uh if I compare with the like past time, uh, my grandmas or like uh, this uh, time, they take like seven or nine children. They have their ability to take these children as much as they can. Like in this time, oh, like women are always trying to keep their family small because they have not like that much ability like they have not that much power like uh, like <clears throat> physical health to like uh, take four or more uh, children like that okay. so it, it's uh, like um, going uh, different from their their times and from uh, our present time right so i also wonder if the public health program you know tries to include birth control and tries to encourage women you know to limit their family size and if that gets to be a big struggle right between women and between men and women um, how much is control of birth and limiting family become a big issue? Um, so the reading for next time is about how COVID has affected women's ability to um, juggle family and career. And I know in Bangladesh, there are more child marriages because of COVID. Because, yes. yeah. So how much of a setback is that? And each of you can look in your own country. So I have you reading something that's a report in general. I think it, it's more globally focused. And then each student can pick out and do some, find something about their own country. But 
going back to these archetypes. So here's what, when you're reading information about things like we do on Wednesdays, what you don't get is these passions, like the way women are really passionate about different things and how much they can really hurt each other or they can really help each other. It's so important. So think of Artemis, right? She's the woods woman, she's aggressive. Um, and she protects women in childbirth. But she, and she becomes a man hater a lot of times because they harm women. You know, she just doesn't like them and she competes with them. But um, a Demeter woman might feel marginalized by an Artemis woman, right? That Artemis women don't care enough about just taking time to raise your kids. Maybe they care about delivering the baby, but they don't have any interest in actually nurturing them and taking care of them. And so sometimes the high achiever types, Athena, Artemis, and Apollo, um, are they're just on a different wavelength, right? So uh, the woman that I had you, you know, the little video clip who started her own uh, genetic, you can find out your gene history uh, business. She, she has her own kids and things, but, you know, she never in her life would she have thought my one goal in life is just to be a mom. Or um, she, you know, once in addition to being a mom, she's a scientist, right? She just loves science. She probably couldn't imagine wanting to spend your whole life taking care of little kids. And that's what I want to give you this sense of that I cannot imagine that. <laughs> I could never do that. Like I really liked my kids. But no, <laughs> to be a daycare provider, or teacher, but when I had the conferences with my kids' teachers, I really admired them. I really respect them. I know my kids, it was so important for my kids that they have good teachers. So the key is to figure out how to nurture women in whatever they are really passionate about and they'll get really good at it. Plus, if they're educated, they can start teaching other women, they can start programs, they can write books, they can um, you know, get funding to have uh, school supplies. There's so many things that a woman who's just obsessed about kids has to offer in the public realm. And, but she might first wanna have her own kids, but then how do you get her, how do you provide opportunities and encouragement for her to go and take some of these very nurturing jobs? Because the rest of us really need them to do that. <laughs> um, and then emotionally, you know, the Artemis types are compete against men and get really annoyed with them when they're violent or they hurt some animals or children or something. The, um, the Athena type, right, tend to identify with the men. And so they sometimes they will be at odds with a woman. Um, a good example of that would be when the legal system, so uh, the Athena types will become politicians, lawyers, or they'll start an NGO or something like that. But um, a good example to me of a Demeter woman was, and Demeter versus Athena, one time in the newspaper, there was a woman whose son, she was a single mom. And the, and the son had been sexually abused by the priest, by his priest. She had entrusted 
her son to this priest to be kind of like a substitute father. And he had sexually abused her son. Well, so the priest was on trial. Okay, so this is Athena's realm uh, legally. So the Demeter is going to hand over, you know, she definitely wants her son. She wants this guy to be punished. And then during the trial, there are a lot of lawyers who get paid a lot of money to undermine a child, a child's testimony on in court to sort of, are you sure you remember that? You know, what color shirt did he have on? I mean, just constantly chipping away, right? And so it was looking like the priest was going to go free. <laughs> now, and this is the great story. I will not forget it because I mean, I was a mom. Um, so one day, a few days after it was looking that way, she came into the courtroom with a gun and she just shot him dead. <laughs> and it's just, I get that, right? I understand how outraged you would be. But that's, there is a trigger for Demeter. And that's why um, it's very important for people who set up laws and institutions to incorporate maternal instinct into culture and not to wound it and not to harm women and women and children and not to set up laws that that um, you know don't acknowledge this particular bond. Um, like there will be laws, for example, uh, a, a, a professional context. Here we have the rules for how you get tenure. Okay, that was my profession. It could be anything. It could be how do you get partnership in a law firm? How do you get partnership in a medical practice. All right, so when you are, you work on your higher education, maybe in your late 20s or something, you get your first job, or sometimes even later, if you're a doctor or a psychiatrist or something, well, then you have to work really, really hard those first few years to get partnership or to get tenure. Well, by that time, you're like, almost 40 years old. <laughs> so in America, these professions are set up so women cannot have both. And that's, that's a choice made by the institutions and the rules and policies and regulations that they make. They don't have to make it that way, but they have until, you know, it's changing somewhat. But for the most part, Women who want to take care of their children while they're young um, have to beg in the US. They have to, the employer who's usually a man is doing them a favor, right? And they depend on him. And so he's being the nice guy instead of the reality, which is she needs to be protected. The guy should think, I have a, a very keen interest in making sure that children grow up stable and happy. So it's my responsibility to give her opportunity. It's not her depending on me, I depend on her, right? And so we've just completely reversed our natural needs and what our natural priorities are. So the culture is just at war against the maternal instinct in a lot of ways, but it's against nature in general, right? So Artemis is really mad because of our fossil fuel use, you know, and our cutting down of trees and killing animals and all that stuff. And um, the Apollonian woman will sometimes, that when they get into the sciences, they get emotionally detached. So in the interview, the journalist said, do you worry that people will abuse this information? 
And she didn't, she didn't, no, no, people need information. They shouldn't be treated like children. So, um, so lots of times in a context where you have a woman, an Apollonian woman, she might just not want to be involved, in, uh, involved emotionally at all, right? She's not anti-male and she's not pro-male. So Artemis is, can get anti-male, whereas Athena can defend the patriarchy, right? And so the Apollonian woman will just say, I don't, you know, I just do science. I just do the facts. She doesn't really want to acknowledge how science plays out. The power of knowledge will play out in this context of culture and the context of male dominated culture. So, well, so when scientists can use knowledge to um, create birth control, right? Birth control pills. It would be, you know, if you ask them, well, what about the impact of this, right? Uh, what about genome um, uh, cloning or something like that? The scientists, as scientists, always say, well, that's not my business, right? I just get the information and create this product, whatever. Um, but again, in a patriarchy, that's not going to play out. Uh, if you just stay detached, it's not going to be objective and detached. It's going to play out in ways that will tend to reinforce the oppression that already exists. And Apoll Apollonian women might just be too much in denial or just too uninvolved in how this fits in into the whole culture in general. And of course, a Demeter woman is going, you know, that's what she really cares about. What's the effect of this on children, on babies, on, you know, the ability for a kid to have their needs met for the first 18 years of their life, right? And she's going to be suspicious and of, you know, are the, is the legal system protecting my babies, you know? Are the expectations at their school, are they, um, is the teacher harming my baby? <laughs> I had a couple teachers, one year I had teachers that were harming my babies and I was not happy. <laughs> I had been, you know, I wasn't picky. There are mothers that every year, you know, her, her kid's teacher isn't good enough. I don't know if you run into this. I don't know if your aunts or people you know talk about this, but uh, from experience, parents obsess about whether the schools are good, whether the teachers are good enough for their kid. Um, and they can and they can be domineering. Do you remember where it said when the dark side of Demeter is that she becomes this all-consuming? mother and she protects her baby from anything she want, just wants them to stay innocent and in love with her and in this bubble and um, there are stereotypes right about mommy's boys that never grow up they never get jobs but that's okay with mommy <laughs> and then um, and then mommy's girls you know but there is the, so that, that's the voice that Demeter will bring in to the conversation, right? It's a very different passion. And all of these are legitimate and they're all, you have to, in order to achieve, you have to be really passionate about them. But they all can go dark. And when they do, the patriarchy will tend to take those conflicts take advantage of those conflicts. So women will pick on other women. So for example, um, well, the legal system harms children or um, women, women who want to nurture will be told by Athena women that they want to have a career and women who want 
um, to nurture, you know, will be told by Apollonian women that they ought to care more about knowledge, right? Like Demeter might not care about um, accumulating knowledge. She might, what if, okay, so knowledge about nutrition, right? A mother should really care about nutrition, but a domineering mother is gonna let her little baby have whatever food he wants <laughs> or she, and it's not helping the kid, but it's feeding that feeling of being a good mother. Um, the other issue here on all of them is that you can be in love with your love of whatever it is, and you alienate everybody else. So Artemis was in love with her love of the environment to the point that people got tired of getting lectured by her and even wanted to rebel against her just because she's so tired of it. <laughs> or Athena is so in love with her love of power that she hides, you know, she ignores the way it's abused. Or um, a, the Apollonian woman is so in love with her love of science that she won't acknowledge the way that a patriarchy can really abuse it. And so the Demeter woman is in love with her love of her children so much that she's willing to ignore or destroy all these other things. So um, on the one hand, every child needs at least one adult that is completely obsessed about them, knows where they are every second for those few years. And it, I mean, I remember I was completely shocked by how I reacted to having a kid or how it grew on me over time. I mean, when I got pregnant, I was completely shocked and I had never ever even had the thought of some human being calling me mommy, right? I mean, I, that's how odd that is. I think, you know, most, I was 20, I had never, you know, envisioned, gee, having a little kid call me mommy ever. And so I was already pregnant and it was a, just this incredibly frightening thought. But over time, it really grew on me. And I grew to be one of those moms, you know, <laughs> that there were these teachers that, that were kind of hurting my kids. And I just wanted to go after them. So um, I know how powerful that drive is. It's just, and it needs to be acknowledged. So how do you create a culture that really accounts for it, acknowledges it? without having mothers just suck up the system and completely ignoring truth and justice just so they can have their little babies or a system that's supposed to be objective or that you know is worried about more important things than little babies ends up wounding those babies so the you know the task of creating a flourishing culture which is what your final paper is about how are women supposed to create a flourishing culture? It's a very complicated task. Um, let's see. So that's, I wanted to emphasize, you know, how women experience those passions first. And then the second part is about just data about whether women can actually um, work with the social, legal, educational, the systems that are in place in each of your countries, that they, can they actually structure a life that juggles family and career? Is it possible? And then related to that, then, who are some examples in your country or in the public eye of women who are either promoting uh, started NGOs or whatever, the focus of their public life 
isn't on, okay, so, so far we've had Artemis, it was ecofeminism, it was environmental stuff. The second one was education, remember science, STEM, especially STEM education. So women in the public eye that focus on women's formal education. The third one is women that focus on giving women access to power, either within a business or within the political system. This one is women who focus on providing women the tools to care for these very vulnerable, dependent little babies, right? So it would be access to um, safe spaces when they're babies, to knowledge about how to feed their babies or um, just anything where the woman's public identity is to focus on um, women's need to nurture their babies and their desire to be mothers and affirming that in some public way and making, um, providing those opportunities or preventing um, the problems. Like this would be um, abuse, like men's abuse, domestic abuse that pits the kids against the uh, mom. So one of the main reasons women don't leave their marriages is because their husband is gonna hurt the kids. Um, you know, he's either gonna get custody or when he, when he realizes she's going to leave, he'll do damage to the kid. So, and I'm sure you have lots of examples, but one example I can think of is that there, every year in my town, there was a domestic violence shelter um, presentation where some women who had been uh, abused spoke. Um, and this one woman said her father abused her and it wasn't sexual abuse, just violence and psychological abuse, constantly belittling her. And the mother had run away because the father was so abusive. So she just woke up one morning and there was no mother. And so she was now, you know, subject to her father's abuse. Well, some guy comes along when she's like 16 or 17 and tells her he loves her. And her, she says, I'm getting out of here. I don't have to put up with this. And her dad said, he's gonna be even worse. And so this guy had a child. I don't know how these guys get custody of these kids, <laughs> but he had custody of his kid who was a little girl. And the, her husband then actually gang raped her. He brought his friends over to the house and they took turns raping her. And she didn't want to leave because she didn't want to leave that little girl with her dad. She didn't want to do what her mother had done, right? She had this mothering instinct to protect that child. And um, so that's just one example of there's, but in general, abusers will do that. They'll, um, they'll tap into that nurturing instinct and the woman will put up with whatever because the kids need the income that the husband provides or she's afraid he's going to start harming them if she doesn't, you know, isn't obedient. So that would be a that would be a, a Demeter type woman. Um, all right. So I'm going to, so I want you to, you know, when you get into groups, but I have one more. Um, oh my gosh, I guess it slipped my mind. Just, oh my gosh. Let's see. Oh yeah, the story of Demeter and Zeus. Okay, that's the one last thing was, 
oh yeah, this is, and this would be interesting. I really would like to know if you have examples, but it's the story of um, Zeus raped Demeter and Persephone was born. And then uh, they were out picking flowers and Hades was attracted to her. He wanted her to be the goddess of the underworld. So he asked permission from her dad, could I abduct your daughter? <laughs> and he says, sure. <laughs> you know, any guy, you know, sort of is attracted to my daughter, of course. And um, so what I'm thinking of with an analogy is when parents, especially dads, the child marriage thing, right? That they will give their daughters over to, you know, rape and abduction, rape, men who abuse them, who, you know, just want them for sex, but it's sex for money, basically, the dad will get money or he won't have to provide for her anymore. And um, she is really victimized, you know, there nobody is, is uh, accounting for her. And then the question is, does the mom go along with this, right? Or is the mom really torn? Because the mom's nurturing instinct wants to protect her from a guy that is really just using her and it's no love, there's no love there. Like her mom would want her to marry somebody who loves her and who she loves, all right? That would be a mother thing. But these child marriages are just sort of, you know, money-based, lust and money, um, sex and aggression. I mean, so I wonder if you have examples of that and you can, not just the child marriage, but are there situations where the mom really feels torn because she can't provide economically for her daughter? And so the husband who does gets to decide if she gets forcibly gets married and who she married. And the mom really feels awful, right? This isn't what she wants for her kid. So if you can think of examples like that, and then if you can think, of, yeah, think of examples of women in the public eye where the focus is. And then if you think of examples of men who are little mommy's boys who never grew up, they run away to their mommy who protects them and doesn't criticize them. And they don't have to achieve anything and they can, and if they have trouble with their spouse, the ma his mother will always blame the spouse and take her under her wing and feel sorry for him because he didn't marry a woman who was good enough for him. I don't know if you know people who, who you know, have one of these possessive moms and she doesn't want her little boy to get married because nobody will be good enough for him. This is when it, you know, it just goes too far. So anyway, I hope you wrote down those things. There's just a number of different points. Um, but I'll let you go and I'll let you. Um, so it's 1020. So or whatever it is in your time, but we'll go 15 minutes. Then we'll have five minutes left to wrap it up and move on to the next thing. So let me put you in some breakout rooms. Um, hopefully you're, you, you know, you're thinking about stuff. You've got ideas. I hope so. Um, Amina, which group were you in? Do you know? Yes, ma'am. I was in group two. Okay. What about you, Pooja? Which group were you in? Professor, I was in, I was with Kasturi, uh, I got disconnected in the middle of that and I just joined. Sorry for that. Uh, okay. She was in room two. Okay. And um, Rafa, which room were you in? Uh, it looks like room two is, is smaller. Okay. All right. So everybody's, everybody's taken care of. Okay.
I think I'm going to see him tomorrow. I think we're both going to be in like the same sappy game match again. Um, but actually, I'm happy. Because I just think of it all as very funny. Um, it's just a relief. Um, but um, it's like, okay, well, do. Okay, so there was a New York Times columnist who was working with the sex slavery or the sex um, trade, right? It's just kind of a business. And um, oh, Thailand is sort of notorious for it. People go on these vacations, uh, Western white guys will go on this 10 day vacation and you know, be put up at a hotel where they can have sex with kids or whatever. Um, and Nicholas Kristoff was trying to get, he chose two girls to try and get out of there and get into a better situation. So one of them went back home. She got a job. She's fine. The other one went back home had an argument with her mom and went back to the prostitute house because the woman who ran it was nicer to her, <laughs> was her friend. So I don't know, life is complicated. Um, anyway, so for next time, I the reading that you have is about how difficult it is for women to juggle family and career. And then I want you to find out in your own countries. And then it's especially hard for Demeter women because they get so torn. Um, I know that my daughter-in-law and my daughter, I mean, it's so unnatural. In my society, my daughter, my oldest daughter had two kids and she's, she's an Athena type. So, she would just get everybody up in the morning and everybody went to daycare or to work, you know, and that was it. Like their whole childhood. Now they're both in school. But I mean, I couldn't, I just would have gone crazy. You know, that many weeks a year, very little vacation. So her, you know, their parents have these very high, high profile jobs, but the kids themselves, when I was growing up, we used to travel a lot. We had all these cultural experiences. We went to Europe because my parents had time off in the summer because they were teachers. And anyway, I mean, the kids are completely programmed. And I don't know, I mean, that isn't natural. But on the other hand, my other son and daughter-in-law, she, after the second kid, she quit working and she was going to be this mom and it was very unnatural because all the other moms were gone and it, and there was no extended family she's from Mexico so it's just her and her kid you know it's just that's not natural what's natural is extended family is you know what's natural is not what modern industrial technological societies have done to the family and there are good things and bad things for women. Uh, we live longer. We have way more time to do things other than just mothering. But on the other hand, mothering has really taken a hit, you know? It, anybody who would like to be reasonable, which I would say work half time until the kids are about seven and work 
two thirds time and, you know, three quarters time, you know, what's so terrible about that? But companies don't hire you because you, it's more complicated. You can't make as much money, whatever. So I don't know what kind of situations that all of you will get into. I myself got into some huge, awful messes, but um, I sure hope you don't do that. And my mothering instinct really got torn apart, but tomorrow I'm gonna see my ex-husband. I'm gonna go to my grandson's soccer game and he'll be there. And right now I saw him yesterday. It's just, it's all pretty funny. I just, I'm so relieved, like I got over it. <laughs> But it took a while and it, my grandson, you know, it's great being a grandma. I love being a grandma. My parents loved that too. So I'll see you next time and read the post, what I have attached and go find some information from your own countries about the difficulties of women juggling little kids, families, and careers. Okay, we'll see you. Bye-bye, off to your next class. And have a good day. Thank you, ma'am. Bye-bye, have a nice day. Thank, Thank, you, Thank you, Professor. Thank you, Professor. Bye. Okay, Mahira, what would you like? Ma'am, I have a Take our attendance. What? I mean, no, did you take our attendance? Yes, I did. Um, 